power. That is why when people consult clairvoyance, when people consult spirit mediums, when people sacrifice to ancestors, there is a form of power that is demonstrated. And it's, it's a reason why it is manifested is to deceive you into thinking that there is nothing else that is necessary because you have seen a measure of the supernatural. Not so. The Bible also speaks about Elisha. You remember when Elisha, when the Syrians had besieged Elisha and his servant, and he was panicking, his servant was panicking, and Elisha said, relax, because those who are with us are more than those who are against them, and then it wasn't, the contest was not about these two that were here, but there was another level where it was being played at, and when he prayed, he was able to see that there were demonic angels surrounding them, these people with, with the Syrians, but that there were also godly angels with wagons that outnumbered these ones, and hence the peace that came from the understanding that their lives, which they were experiencing naturally were being lived at a supernatural level and that's where they were being affected and I, we need to understand that so we then determine the outcome of that battle as far as God is concerned you must understand that the devil is defeated by God God has all capacity to defeat Satan but there's a certain activation that must come from us that causes the sway in the direction of that battle it, it is not enough for you to own a radio set without batteries. It has all the potential to give you the news that you need to be announced to you that you have won the lottery. But if it is, you have no electricity, if you have no batteries, if you don't go out of your way to energize your wireless, you will live with information that was based for you without knowing it. And so your lottery will be won, but you will never know because you didn't do what was in your power to energize the potential of something that was predetermined for you. Are we together? So the battle has been won by God, but there is an activation that you and I are responsible for. It is not the power of heaven that is at work in you. It is the power of God that you allow in your life that is at work. And I want to say to you that the activation of the supernatural is through sacrifice. Are you with me? Both in the good, in the kingdom of God and in the demonic world. If you are not prepared to pay a price, if you are not prepared to sacrifice, sacrifice means postponement of that which could have given me much pleasure comfort and satisfaction now and giving it into another situation where I believe that the outcome from that situation is greater than what I could experience now. Say amen if you got that. So it's taking something that could have made you happy now, could have satisfied you now with the understanding that if I put it there, out of there is going to come something greater than what I could experience now. And what comes out of there is going to last longer. What comes out of there is going to bless me more. That is all that sacrifice is. That's why we bring a sacrifice of praise. Amen? Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 26. You may just want to write this down because we don't really have much time to go through the scriptures, but write them down. This is a story of good against evil. There's a, an ungodly king who was fighting against Israel. And he is losing the battle. And he gets 700 reinforcements and he is still losing the battle. Then he takes his son, his firstborn son, who is going to be king after him. And he takes him and he sacrifices him to a, to a demonic god. And the Bible says the effect of that sacrifice was that Israel of God was overcome. Did you hear what I said? A large sacrifice. This guy took his son, the next king, sacrificed him to a demonic god, caused such an activation of demonic spirits that the children of God were overcome in that battle. If you come from the continent where I come from, you know how much blood sacrifice we have made. No child is born without a sacrifice. There's a mbuzi that must be slaughtered, kusungira. No one is, there is a bira that must be brewed. There's a lot of blood that we have sacrificed and activated demonic forces so much that the evidence of the power of God on our lives is diminished. 
And so for us to be able to see the things that we're supposed to do, we have to do counter. Now this is from the Bible. The only reason why God responded to Solomon was because Solomon, when he became king, immediately went and sacrificed 22,000 beasts. And on the night that he sacrificed 22,000 beasts, God called him by his first name and said, Solomon, what is it that you want me to do for you? Because God, and there was such an activation in the positive that far outweighed any negative sacrifices that have, because there are sacrifices that have been made in each one of our names. And I'm so bold as to say, regardless of where you come from. Amen? More so for us who come from the African continent. Our parents have, and our forefathers, before they understood God, have given sacrifice upon sacrifice. And so that's why you find that sometimes it's one step forward, two back. That's why your car doesn't go forward the way it should. That's why your breakthroughs are out of proportion to the amount of praying, to the amount of fasting. The most fasted people are on the African continent. The most biblically read, the most prayed, the most worshipped, the most everything in Africa is about our kind of godliness. But we don't understand fully that we have to redeem the negative sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Amen? Say amen if you got that. So God understands sacrifice. He says, those who sow in what? Shall reap in joy. So when you go to your sowing, it must be painful. It must be an extraction of something from you so that eventually... The outcome is that you will reap in joy, but it is going to cost you when you are sowing. Amen? The Bible says in 2 Samuel 24, 24, write it down, 2 Samuel 24, 24, David has committed a sin. There's a judgment against Israel, and God has sent a plague and is destroying. And the plague has come to an end, and the man of God comes and tells David that he must go and sacrifice at the uh, field of Arauna. David, as king, goes to this man, and the man says, why are you here? He says, I've come to buy this plot of land that I can build an altar and that I can reverse this tide against my people. And the man, understanding and being gracious towards David, said, I'll give you the land, I'll give you the cattle, I'll give you the goats, everything that you need to sacrifice. And David flat refuses and says, I will not give to God that which costs me nothing. And he pays for it even though it had been offered. Let me say this to you. The one who needs the deliverance is the one who must pay the price. The one who needs to be set free. David had got his nation into this trouble. So if you are the one that has something that you know is a resistance against you, you have to pay the price. It's not enough for other people in the church to pay the price for you. It's not enough for someone to lend you. Have you seen this? I have nothing against it, especially when you're dealing with children, when the offering bucket comes and you give each other money to put into the offering. That is not for a person who's seeking deliverance. When you are seeking deliverance, you pay. Let it make you sweat. Let it make you want to die. That is when you are going to get the activation that you're looking for. If you look in Malachi chapter 6, God says, I'm sick of your offerings. Because your offerings don't mean anything to you. And why should they mean anything to me? He says, you bring me blind animals. You bring me deformed goats. And he says, try giving these to your governors. You see, we understand so much about dealing with worldly authority. But we don't understand dealing with godly authority. You would never give something just to the mayor of London that wasn't of the highest standard. But when we come before God, we give God change. We give, we give God things that we don't want. We give to orphans what is left in our cupboard, what doesn't fit, what has holes in it. And God just watches because you're just, you are still playing. Give something that costs you something. I'm going to give you a, a little example. When we were building the celebration center, and we made a pledge for half a million dollars those days, and we couldn't meet the pledge. I had a court case that was pending where I was expecting to get 900,000 US dollars. So I said to God, when the date of my pledge came in, I said, God, if you make me win my court case, you know that I'm going to do much more than what I have pledged. And God said, wrong way around. I, you, I don't do something for you so that you do something for me. He says, do something yourself. What is it that you have? And our best car at the time is what we decided we were going to give. And it cost us 
It was painful. And we saw that. But little did I know what was going to happen to our country. Little did I know that that investment and God subsequently has had us in the area of cars, has had us so into the ministry and to the men of God, three or four cars. And it was insurance. God knew the tide of poverty. I am the first, my father's children are the first in our family to go to university in the whole Wazara clan. We don't have any relatives that live over. You know how people have relatives overseas that have prospered? We are the first in our family to get onto an airplane. So I know the weight of poverty. I weight the intention of Satan against my life. On top of that, he takes my father away when I'm 11 years old just to cap it and to make sure that I amount to nothing. So I understand that when I give, I give as an insurance for the future. And so we go now through how many years? Have we been seven, eight years in Zimbabwe? Very minuscule salary, very terrible economy. But I have five children, four children and an additional one, and they're all going into private school. There we have no lack of transport, no lack of food, no lack in that environment because I believe the sacrifice that was made at that time. God is not going to honor what you give as you don't give from the abundance of your possessions. You give from your available possessions. That's why the widow with the might was called by Jesus to have given more because she gave out of her lack and out of her poverty. That's why the church in Macedonia was commended by Paul that they gave much more than they were able to give. It means that they gave things that they needed themselves for their sustenance. Amen. That's the only way that you give more than what you are able to give. Amen. So it must cost you something in order to reverse the tide that is against you. Understand this. You are sacrificed so highly in the negative. You have to redeem that your giving to the Lord and to the assignments of God has got to be greater than what you gave and what was given on your behalf. You sacrifice also on behalf of generations that are in your loins and generations that are to come. Amen. He said, whatever you give up for the kingdom, houses, brothers, sisters, in this lifetime, you will get a hundredfold uh, with persecutions though and in the life to come, eternal life, Mark 10, verse 29. Understand that God needs you to sacrifice, wants you to sacrifice, but you need to sacrifice more than God needs you to sacrifice because you have to understand you are the one that has got to be set free. And our giving has to change. Our attitude has, if it has never cost you, I'm talking about people now, we have started to understand this. People give whole salaries. People give cars. People give tracts of land. They're not show-offs. They understand what they've got to do. And I'm talking here about the work of God. Now let me close with one that really affects the religious mind. I told you that you are my family and we are remiss in our responsibility if we come here and we don't let you have this information. Here's my question. What have I done? Oh. I think she's saying I should wipe the sweat off my brow. <laughs> Where your treasure is, there, your heart will be also. We try to skirt around the subject of money. Money is the representation of who you are. The stubs in your checkbook tell us the story of what you really believe in. Where your money is, there is your heart. Because you spend all your life generating that money. So your life is represented by the wage that you have and the savings that you have and the investments. That is your life. Now the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart is also. People who treasure the things of God give to the work of God. Amen? Now, the Bible says that those who are among you that labor in the word are worthy of double honor. I'm going to give leave you with a secret. I said we give to one another. That is fine. We give to the work of God. That is good. 
But the one that is most difficult is to take care and to sow into the lives of our men of God. Did you hear what I said? 1 Samuel chapter 9. Saul has lost his father's donkeys. And he's going to look for his father's donkeys. He has not found them. And he is frustrated. And his servant says, but there's a man of God over there. Everything that he says comes to pass. And Saul says, but we are not able to go there because I do not have a gift to give to him. His understanding is that I have to approach this man of God in a way that makes him understand that I am not regarding him as common. And so if he's my buddy, if he's just someone that I need shelter from, if he's just another citizen of this city, I could just approach him. But I want to approach him with a gift to make him understand that my mindset towards him is different. We understand this. If you have ever seen anyone going to a witch doctor, they do not go, they don't wear their shoes. They take their shoes off. They don't stand when the witch doctor is, is sitting down. They grovel. And they always give a gift. And the gift is to the determination of the witch doctor. And it is never questioned. And when we come to our men and to our man of God, the way that we determine that you are not just my buddy, you are not just my uncle, you are not just my friend. If you're coming to make an inquiry based on the anointing that you reckon, you allow that anointing to flow by the seed that you sow. Did you hear what I said? You recognize, you see, we do this for our wives. The more the ring. There is things that I can say to Priscilla with one ring that I could never say with words. And, and she, when she finds out how much I spent on the ring, she gets an understanding of how valuable she is to me in the natural. When you sow a seed into the... You see, where we got it wrong in Africa is the missionaries came to us. They took care of us. That's why the blessing that was supposed to be on our lives. Father Rowan was the one who paid your children's school fees. He's the one who paid for you in hospital. And he was the provider. That's not so in the Bible, according to 1 Timothy 5.17, that you were supposed to take care of Father Rowan to get the blessing that was in Father Rowan for you. And we are supposed to take care of our men of God, our man of God, and to sow into his life in order to cause a flow of what we recognize in the spirit is inside. I want to ask Denton and his wife just to come and stand here. I'm out of time. I'm just going to please just do this testimony. And um, Denton, where are you? Where's your wife? And I'm not going to let you guys share, but I'm going, to sh I'm going to paraphrase your testimony. Because this is, listen, religion will tell you that if you are giving, listen to me, if you are giving to a man of God, you are worshiping a man of God. Understand, I've given you the parallel. When your parents, and some of you have been involved, just last week I had a lady from the church whose fiancé was backtracking. And she prayed, she sought everything, and when those things were not yielding the results that she wanted, she went to an apostory man, and went to consult and was asked to bring $1.5 million so that the apostle could give him some shonga to get the husband back. It's just, it's just a, a witch doctor. She was, as a born-again believer, willing to take a gift to a man of that God, not our God. Okay? Understanding this. But when you tell the same person to give a gift to a spiritual man of God, it comes somehow as man worship, personality, cult, propagation. Can you not see that that is a deception of Satan? Are you with me? Now, this couple here, Denton is a physics teacher. Oh. Okay, no, I'm, I want to just um, uh, frame it. Denton is a physics teacher from Zimbabwe who did a master's in physics at Cambridge. 
that he couldn't afford to pay for. He was in the UK and his wife was in Zimbabwe. She applied for a visa as a student visitor's visa and she did not get those visas. And the family was separated. She was serving as the armor bearer to the pastor in Kadoma. And Pastor Bonnie came to the church in Kadoma. And she determined that she would sow a seed into Pastor Bonnie's anointing for the breakthroughs in her life. And I want you guys just to summarize what happened after that. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the pastor for this opportunity. Uh, when I heard Pastor Bonnie and Pastor Tom were coming to Kaduma to commission the church in Kaduma, I'd been dealing with many difficulties in my life. First, I was worried about my future, uh, what, how things were going to be like. Being separated, my husband came to the UK in 2004, and I tried so many times to come, and I couldn't join him. At one time, I was tempted to look for a Malawian passport, but I didn't have the courage to do that. And at one time, I had a friend of mine who was a magistrate, and she said to me, you know what? I could fake a marriage certificate for you, and you could go to UK. And I asked myself that, God, is this the life that you want for me? Will I be proud the whole of my life with those fake papers even if I go into UK? And I said, God, this is not what you want. If you blessed my husband and you opened the door for him to go into the UK, you are a God of order, and I want order in my life. So when Pastor Bonnie was coming, I felt in my heart I needed to sow in order to get a breakthrough in my life. But I said to myself, this is me. How can I reach to Pastor Bonnie? So I, I brought my seed before my pastor in Kadoma, Pastor Imelda. And I said it was at a ladies meeting on Saturday and they were due to come on Sunday. And I said to Pastor Imelda, Pastor Imelda, could you please pass this gift to Pastor Bonnie for me? And Pastor Imelda looked at me and she said, no, hold on to it. I want you to give it to him yourself. And I knew that was my moment. I couldn't sleep that night and I prayed. I said, God, make me steady. I don't want to go before the woman of God and begin to make foolish utterances. I won't say a word, and I won't even ask her to pray for me. But just that two seconds of her attention in my life and the attention of the angels that are running behind you, that was my moment. And my season began. Things began to happen. For the first time since he had come here in 2004, Denton was able to come home last year in August and we got married in Celebration Church, the first wedding at Celebration Church, Kadoma. Um, he used to love drinking. He stopped drinking. He was not a born again Christian, but today because of the grace of the Lord, he's standing in front of us. And God is doing so much more. And Pastor Tom, like you said last year, I finished strong. On the 29th of December, 2006, I obtained my clearance to come into the UK. Thank you. Amen. Now, the other part that she didn't share was that she encouraged Denton to come to church here in London. And he was not committed to the things of God. And on the day that he was here, Pastor E was in transit and came here and was preaching here. He's the only person that responded to the altar call that day. And now, not only did he do his master's at Cambridge, he got a scholarship that paid for his master's. At the school where he's teaching, he has become head of faculty of physics at that school. Now, I'm going to close by saying this. 
there was a tide against this couple. Demonic forces, they had prayed, as you heard, she had tried everything. But recognizing that God has anointed a woman of God, and recognizing that anointing, as I shared with you the other day, that if you receive the one that God has sent, you receive God, that has caused a ripple of breakthroughs that they didn't even know to pray for. And God has done it for them. God is just beginning in your lives. And God is just beginning in the lives of those that are here that will take this word and make it their own. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was so powerful. Another special time we're going into. Offering time. Offering time. Offering time. Amen. Amen. If you need to make a check, please make it payable to hear the word. If you need an envelope, please just raise up your hand. And I, I believe um, Mr. Wazara has just set the precedent right now. We've got another man of God who also, I believe, he was telling me his testament the other day. He's been sowing seed into the ministry, into the man and woman of God. And he's another son in the house. Please, could you help us welcome Mr. Jeff Mzwimbi. Thank you. Please be seated. That was awesome, Mr. Wazara. And I want to continue on, on that theme. Because you see, <laughs> I was battling about this as he was speaking, and immediately a scripture was dropped into my spirit. You know the story of Esau and Jacob, as Amai explained the other day. When Esau came home and discovered that Jacob had been blessed, this is in Genesis 27, when he discovered, verse 40, that Jacob had been blessed, he said to the father, don't you have anything else left for me? And he was told, you know, this, this kind of blessing, there is nothing, I've already blessed your brother, he deceived you, but I've nothing left. And he cried until the father said, let me let you into your secret. When thou hast become restless, when thou hast become restless, only then will you be able to break this yoke upon your neck. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you are comfortable with where you are. I don't know. But if you become restless and decide to break this yoke, there is no reason that you should be exactly the same as any other African immigrant who has come into this country. That ceiling that stops you from getting a portion of this land must be broken. It is up to you. It is up to you. There is no reason why you should not own property in this country. There is no reason why you should not own businesses.